So, so all are allowed to share now. Uh, so let me just briefly introduce today's event. So this uh, is uh, a discussion on the role of social media and dissemination of disinformation is a part of the project Advancing Media Literacy and Democratic Resilience, organized by the Center for Policy Studies with Berlin-based organization Crisis Simulation for Peace with support from the German Federal Foreign Office. And today I'm glad to have some of our project researchers and uh, here, Victoria Melkonian and Edgar Vartanian, and also I'm glad that uh, Rastislav Kuzel from Memo 98 from Slovakia could join us today. And uh, we will uh, discuss some issues about the role of social networks played currently. Because in the recent years, this political polarization has become a frequent subject of political debate and scholarly studies. And uh, there are different studies showing that social media exacerbate polarization, even though they may not be the main cause, the root cause. In yeah. one such study in the Science Journal 2020, a group of researchers wrote that social media companies like Facebook and Twitter have played an influential role in political discourse, intensifying political sectarianism. And they brought in results of a recent field experiment, which showed that Americans who deactivated Facebook accounts became less polarized. And there was another article in the Trends in Cognitive Sciences in 2021, showing focusing on both observational and experimental evidence of online behavior. And also it showed that uh, people who are off Facebook are less likely to have polarized opinions, especially about uh, policy priorities, although it's less important in case of affective preferences, so like feelings about the opposite party. And also, oh, yes, as could be noticed before, the social media had this business model based on creating bubbles of friends and followers. So, with the use of big data algorithms, they you do that, and that also multiplies the negative effect by supplying people with selected information that they could probably like. So this also contributes to confirmation bias and polarization. And uh, uh, now I would like to ask Victoria to share her observations about the subject. So can I start, Armen? Uh, I hope you can uh, hear me clearly. So, um, dear colleagues, uh, uh, Mr. Uh, sorry, Mr. Kuzel and uh, Mr. Vartanian, uh, I'm very happy to join uh, this um, um, meeting. Uh, I will have some points regarding this information and how social media have specific input in dissemination of uh, uh, this information. And it's a part of a research component that uh, we have in the frame of advancing media literacy in democratic resilience project organized with uh, crisis simulation for peace organization, Berlin based. And um, along with uh, uh, several uh, research components that we have in the project, we also organize non-formal educational meetings in the, fa in the face of uh, um, trainings with uh, different uh, target groups uh, from uh, regions in Armenia. Uh, we have done uh, at least um, eight uh, meetings in the frame of that project in Armavir, in Yerevan, in Van Azor, and also in um, Gyumri uh, and Ijevan. So uh, our um, non-formal educational formats are continuing. However, 
um, uh, we also started um, to discuss a research components. And from me, uh, I will uh, start with uh, start with several theoretical uh, points that will be, let's say, a kind of fundament for our uh, ongoing uh, works. And I will be happy also uh, to hear from hear from you. Um, uh, your expertise, uh, Mr. Kuzel, and also uh, research from uh, Mr. Vartanian. So if I may, I just can uh, share my uh, screen uh, with main notes. There it is. So what we have here is the, um, excuse me, is the fact that uh, the development of digital technologies and social media itself significantly changed the quality of information. And uh, as we know, information is the main component for any kind of communication, especially when we talk about political communication as a core um, a process for democratic development. We need to know that uh, the quality of information is very important in case we talk about false information uh, or, I don't know, disinformation, uh, we need to uh, prove that the communication between different actors, it can be uh, actors inside society or uh, state authorities uh, with uh, political parties or uh, citizens, uh, this kind of communication can't be healthy and constructive. So uh, when we uh, go back to traditional media as a main source of information, uh, we saw the limited number of news channels which provide better formulated and carefully checked information. But in case of social media, we see um, a significant change in number and also quick attitude in uh, their actions. Uh, which doubled the risks of getting low quality and non-trustful information regard regarding to this or that event. And especially when we talk about, um, uh, um, uh, let's say, um, uh, significant events uh, uh, on social and political sphere, uh, we, we should uh, pay attention that uh, the manipulative information uh, will uh, uh, undoubtedly uh, harm people. Uh, not only offline uh, online users, but also uh, offline users, uh, since we all know the um, effect of snowball and how virtual information can be spread among non-digital society too. And the same situation, uh, unfortunately, in Armenia. So uh, we also hi highlight that um, um, that not all the false information on uh, and news on social media are considered to be disinformation, because there are different types of non-reliable information, uh, fake information, which we also called misinformation and malinformation. Uh, and um, surely all the uh, the types of fake information have negative influ uh, influence on uh, the users on society and uh, other uh, political and non-political actors. But uh, there is huge need to categorize and separate them. So uh, we have um, this information as false information, which is knowingly shared and the main aim is to cause harm. We have misinformation when false information is shared but no harm is meant. In case of misinformation in Armenia, there is a very widespread uh, usage of non-professional attitude among journalists and uh, among content makers who share information without uh, checking, without paying proper attention on content making process. And unfortunately, this kind of uh, non-quality information will um, uh, significantly um, harm um, uh, people. But the main aim of such kind of uh, uh, information actually is not um, um, uh, is not making some uh, harm uh, or causing harm. So in case of malinformation, we uh, encounter genuine information, which is shared to cause 
uh, harm. Uh, or for example, uh, the conversation during email conversation between two different political actors um, and uh, the information that uh, exists in mail uh, can be uh, true. However, is not um, uh, uh, is not an information that should be um, should be uh, shared among other people. So uh, this kind of uh, information flow is also can be harmful uh, for uh, many. So uh, another uh, uh, another definitions that we have from the literature is that the aim of this information is manipulation through the distortion of reality. And uh, this information is a type of propaganda aimed at creating false beliefs and misguide people through all the uh, accessible sources. An intentional uh, pro propaganda of fake news and distrustful information, uh, which is accompanied with the organized mass uh, mass online and offline discussion, uh, discussions in order to gain uh, specific political dividends. That's all from the side of uh, definitions uh, that we have and we used to consider during our research uh, work process and also during our trainings and uh, communication with uh, our targets group. And the main sources that we consider as uh, main disseminators of this information or misinformation or I don't know, malinformation are uh, hyper-partisan media, mushroom and clickbait sites, bots, uh, confirmation bias as phenomena, individual and hard trolls, uh, con conspiracy theories and fake narratives, but I would like to pay your attention on two uh, other concepts that we used to discuss in the frame of this information. It's uh, human emotions on social media, uh, generally uh, in vir virtual space, and the um, effect of influencers or public figures that interact and um, uh, uh, and due to their interaction with their followers and with their uh, audience, they uh, may um, disseminate false information. So. Uh, human emotions um, during the global crises, events of national and state importance, significant historical developments are always accompanied with huge flow of information which play on people's emotions. Um, um, they mainly hinder people to think rationally, and uh, these uh, conditions um, uh, are very uh, productive for, let's say, this information to be disseminated. Uh, because uh, we have such kind of situation. Actually, first of all, people are united with the feelings of loss and pain. Just remember uh, COVID um, as a uh, health crisis uh, that uh, we encounter. During the first uh, part of uh, virus uh, dissemination, we saw that uh, people are uh, united uh, because um, uh, the, the situation that um, unites them are um, uh, general for all of them. However, after the um, uh, severe, uh, um, after when uh, the situation was much more severe, we uh, saw that uh, people um, uh, used to blame each other or different actors. Uh, who are uh, engaged in the process, um, not process, but in reality. Uh, those can uh, be government or other civil society institutions. And when we uh, think about conspiracy theories and fake narratives, we saw how uh, foreign um, uh, social media um, sources uh, played a huge role on people's uh thinking uh, regarding to this situation and actually um uh, uh information related to uh covid um uh, has a very um a significant um, uh, um uh, how to say um a significant um maybe a uh, face of uh, false information based on the fa uh, fake narratives and conspiracy theories uh, which came from uh, foreign um, uh, actor, media actors uh, and so on. 
Um, when we talk about influencers uh, or public figures, um, they also can serve, as I said, a source of disinformation because um, uh, when, uh, even when they, be, uh, especially when they belong to a specific political or social grouping, or when they have a specific political orientation, uh, due to their uh, tactics on social media and the usage of digital tools such as uh, lives or story, uh, they uh, talk with their audiences without any. Uh, justified or checked uh, uh, based on without any justified or checked information. Actually, this irrational behavior and biased behavior um, will inspire and direct many uh, followers. So it's uh, also, also um, um, uh, considered as a flow, uh, as a potential flow of uh, disinformation. Um, and a very interesting uh, concept regarding to a mushroom and clickbait sites. Sites we have a center called Media Initiative Center. It's based in Yerevan, and it uh, mainly focused on uh, social media research. Uh, uh, this uh, center uh, defined uh, the mushroom sites, uh, ma mushroom sites as uh, social media outlets and provide um, uh, portals that provide information. Information, but this information isn't considered to be professional media. Uh, this portal isn't considered to be professional media portal. However, uh, they um, interact like this. Uh, and uh, what is interesting uh, that um, the, uh, they um, grow like mushrooms and we can see uh, even that they live uh, sh uh, short and uh, the site that we used to know uh, as an um, information, as a source of information uh, can uh, uh, can um, exist uh, just uh, two uh, weeks and after it's simply deleted from uh, social sphere, sphere, virtual sphere. So um, uh, the main characteristics of such uh, called the mushroom uh, sites are that that they uh, do not create their own content. They mainly used to uh, copy, pay, uh, copy uh, others. And uh, we see that uh, they even uh, uh, do not mention uh, um, uh, any source of author of the previous, uh, co the, the copied content, I mean. So uh, another problem is clickbait si uh, sites that um, uh, seems to direct people to news coverages, but actually uh, we even uh, unable to read any news uh, when we are entering to the site. But uh, we see that um, uh, this kind of sites uh, just uh, seek for um, financial profit and um, um their main activities are to gain high number of uh, clicks uh, so uh, with all this um let's say kind of um, uh, see, uh, seeming yeah social media outlets we see the huge necessity of um uh, legal definition what is social media actually and how we can properly uh, categorize what is social media what is not um, of course, in Armenia in 2020, we had some um, uh, some changes in uh, law on media, especially uh, with the high focus on audiovisual media, and uh, we have also um, success in um, in adding own or least hosting uh, concept uh, in the legal field. However, is not enough. Uh, and actually, there are a lot of changes that should be properly um, done uh, in legal uh, field in order to be uh, in order to overcome the main gaps regarding social media uh, definitions. Uh, so, uh, as a main um, sum up points, and also let's say in many cases recommendations, I just uh, added in my PowerPoint these uh, four points, and uh, we strongly believe that uh, they are uh, very important both to discuss and take into account during the policy making. Um, during the policy making, actually, this information is not the only threat that we interact 
Um, in Armenia, actually, this information is always, uh, not always, but often. Uh, however, when we talk about political situation, yeah, we often uh, see that um, it accompanies with uh, hate speech, uh, let's say political hate speech, which can uh, also in turn promote societal and political polarization and ideological intolerance both among society and also between different political actors. So um, development of uh, information society with uh, high critical thinking and information and digital literal standards can form an active immunity from the negative immunity in society, yeah? Uh, and also in uh, among political actors from the negative impacts of this information. Uh, we used to uh, highlight this because we strongly believe that uh, democracy and the consolidation of democracy is unable to overcome the roots of this information. Uh, because uh, in case you use social media, you will um, interact with this information in daily basis, even in daily basis. And you just need to uh, make some uh, media hygiene procedures and also do all the possible things that will protect your immunity, your uh, political uh, behavior, your um, uh, uh, political uh, thinking uh, from this kind of negative uh, influences. And as a recommendation to state authorities, uh, because we consider that state is uh, a key uh, actor in uh, the uh, in combating on uh, on the process of combating uh, this information, uh, we think that a state authorities should implement very effective professional and addressed public relation policy. When we go back to uh, the uh, Nagorno-Karabakh war on 2020, uh, we saw uh, a, a, a crisis situation in communication with state authorities to society and media. We saw that the state is unable to provide proper information and information uh, which would be uh, professionally uh, formulated and quick uh, information, uh, which would be main source for media and society to be informed about ongoing war on borders. Uh, so that's why we had information vacuum at that time in our uh, media sphere and all the uh, possible uh, disinformation, foreign dis disinformation and domestic disinformation came to fill this uh, vacuum. And uh, this uh, poor quality and fake information uh, was the main, let's say, uh, um, main uh, information that people used to uh, take into account and um, uh, and uh, use in a communication with others. So and uh, uh, after uh, we would like to pay your attention on a stereotype that currently exists in our society, is that the main. Um, responsiveness goes to the generator of this information. Yeah, if we think that this information came from Azerbaijan or it's a Russian-based information, uh, this information, we uh, saw the main, uh, uh, give the main blame to uh, these generators of this information. But the uh, fact is that consumers uh, are also responsible uh, for the dissemination of this disinformation because uh, people used to share, reshare uh, information without any uh, efforts to uh, check it twice or three times or just think, uh, not check, but think about this kind of disinformation because even headlines of uh, main, main news, uh, new, uh, this information news can um, say about the quality of the content. So uh, we consider that consumers, uh, whether it's media or political actor or a citizen, should take responsiveness uh, to uh, dissemination of any kind of information because they are also a part of the circulation uh, of this information. So um, that's uh, the main points for, from me. If you have uh, any other uh, questions, we can discuss it. Um, 
uh, discuss it. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much indeed. And now I would like to pass the floor to Edgar to share his uh, research and his thoughts. Thank you very much. Uh, my research uh, is uh, dedicated to the propaganda, the propaganda issue, and uh, uh, more correctly, uh, anti-democratic propaganda. And uh, I revealed that uh, we have some big narratives in these uh, propaganda uh, and uh, that in our region, I mean, not only South, South Caucasus region, uh, I mean, post-Soviet region, uh, uh, we, we have uh, many, many similarities uh, in our anti-democratic uh, discourse. And uh, I will share with uh, some examples uh, with uh, these uh, from from these discourses. Um, <clears throat> yeah, and some theoretical uh, things that um, I mentioned in my article that uh, main anti-democratic um, and anti-Western uh, propagandistic narratives uh, con connected with uh, far-right populistic narratives. And... Uh, I mean that uh, by, by uh, uh, we have a very uh, I have a very specific definition of populism. Uh, populism is not um, opportunism. Is not um, uh, it's a it's a, it it has a it, it is a narrow ideology according to one of the famous uh, researchers, uh, Karl Smoot, uh, populism is a narrow ideology. Uh, it means that it isn't uh, self-sufficient uh, and uh, existing only together with one of the so-called big ideologies. And according to uh, this ideology, according to uh, populism, uh, uh, according to this definition, uh, society is uh, divided into two homogeneous and uh, conflicting groups, uh, pure people and corrupted elite. And according to populist rhetorics, uh, politics should express the universal will uh, of those pure people. Uh, and uh, far-right populism is an ideology that uh, combines at least three characteristics, uh, nativism, uh, authoritarianism, and of course, populism. Uh, and some um, some examples uh, from Armenian uh, populistic, uh, anti-democratic, anti-Western narratives. Uh, just a moment. Yeah, 
uh, I would say that one of the main target of uh, anti-democratic uh, propaganda is civil society. Uh, and uh, civil society is the target of ultra conservative and uh, pro-Russian media and uh, politicians. Uh, and uh, one of their popular narratives is that uh, nation uh, is in danger, is in danger because external forces uh, have, and uh, yeah, because external forces have captured the state, invaded the state. Uh, for example, um, <clears throat> In one of the articles, uh, not, yeah, uh, we have such a statements that statement that non-governmental organization organizations receiving uh, Western grants and were uh, yeah and uh, in the attacks on the state and the charge. specific representatives of the Western world uh, were also accused. Uh, for example, uh, fate is in danger today because since May 28, the Armenian Apostolic Church and Catholics of all Armenians have been subjected to unprecedented attacks. Those attacks entered a new phase when the BBC media, operating under the control of the Queen of the Great Britain, joined the process against the Armenian Church. Uh, and uh, one of the main points of anti-Russian propaganda uh, is uh, uh, Accusation, uh, accusation of of the West, uh, and they said that the West uh, wants to destroy our national identity. Uh, one example: the same West spends millions of dollars in today's Armenia in the exact opposite direction. That is to destroy Armenian nationalism, to destroy national values, religion, national institutions, and social and political forces, and instead to introduce perversion, filthy and destructive systems. Um, this is about the need to protect to protect traditional values were often presented in the context of the uh, narratives that uh, the west intends to destroy the institution of the family uh, destroy people and uh, uh, exercise the control of them uh, policies um, yeah, and policies of the Kremlin were often uh, directly praised in different areas, uh, specifically in the fight for traditional values. Uh, in particular, it was noted that in Russia, there is a struggle against so-called LGBT propaganda that the activities of George Soros and uh, Jehovah's uh, Witnesses are banned in Russia. Uh, and um, maybe one, else, one example also. Uh, in Armenian uh, anti-democratic uh, discourse, uh, we see that uh, in uh, general, the Armenian authorities and uh, of course also uh, civil society, active 
part of civil society, yeah, uh, were uh, criticized for, as I said, for allegedly uh, destroying uh, the Armenian uh, ident identity. And uh, narratives used uh, the Kremlin's method of discrediting the concept of liberalism by using it uh, together with um, with words uh, with words with negative connotations. And uh, an example is the claim that uh, instead of liberalism, the West instills fascism. And liberal fascists are spending huge amounts of money to mock tradition, for example, one of uh, statements from this uh, discourse. Yeah, and this ties uh, into another common narrative that Europe uh, is in decay uh, due to the uh, flow of migrants, uh, but also because globalist forces are uh, interfering to destroy Europe. And this is, uh, this is uh, spread not only by right-wing populists, not only in uh, Armenia, uh, but around the world. Okay, and And last point, um, very often uh, in uh, far-right populistic discourse in post-Soviet space, especially in Armenia, uh, in Georgia, uh, in Russia, uh, in Moldova also, um, uh, West uh, considers as a, as a center uh, who spreads uh, who, who spreads uh, pro pro LGBT uh, values who's, uh, who 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 do pro LGBT propaganda. And uh, it means that uh, liberalism is only about uh, LGBTQ uh, and that uh, other things uh, such as uh, free speech, uh, uh, free uh, uh, right uh, of uh, Assemblies, uh, etc., is uh, is not important. Are not important things. That the main important uh, thing uh, in in the West in uh, liberalism is only LGBT. And uh, they said that uh, if you want to preserve your national identity. Uh, you should fight against liberalism. Why? Because liberalism is about LGBT and nothing else. Uh, that's it. It's uh, 
main main point, points uh, that uh, I wanted to present. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Edgar. Actually, uh, I remember since at least the time when Armenia applied for Council of Europe membership and then joined it in 2001. So at least since then, this uh, tendency started to equate the Western values with apostasy of traditional religious beliefs and sexual perversions. <clears throat> but also this yeah. pattern repeated itself many times. Um, for example, before the, well, in 2011-12, before the decision not to uh, sign the association agreement with the EU, when it was on discussion, uh, there was a similar tendency, and but it was similar to other countries which were negotiating the association agreements. So the same kind of propaganda was used, of and course. even structures which were very vocal in that regard were named the same, like parents' committees in Georgia, in mm -hmm. Moldova, I suppose in Ukraine as well. So mm -hmm. uh, we can observe that uh, there are shared narratives and uh, the and yeah. they are inspired from the same center. And even uh, and there was a lack of like uh, yeah. imagination in naming those structures which engaged in such propaganda. And they often uh, use very uh, similar words for accusing uh, West. They, uh, and uh, main of these uh, words has uh, has in its structure Russian words. Uh, I mean uh, words like uh, pederast, liberast, uh, etc. Mm, yes, yeah. uh, well, those have been in use until now, even. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and uh, specifically for the. Last one you mentioned, even 2018 19, the Vitor and Adekvad and those groups in Armenia mm -hmm. used that label as well. Yeah. Oh, thank you. So uh, now uh, I want to turn to Rastislav Kuzel from Slovakia and he asked to present the Slovak experience with this issue and uh, perhaps the effect of the use of social networks and how they are used for disinformation on the recent elections. Well, thank you very much, uh, Armen, and, and thanks to Victoria and Edgar for these uh, presentations. Maybe before I start, um, I was just wondering, um, I mean, uh, Victoria, you presented the actual impact of, uh, of social media. Uh, more as a theoretical concept, but, but I was just curious if you had a chance to actually apply some of these concepts uh, in a concrete uh, monitoring. I, I, I was actually um, in Yerevan uh, before the local elections. Uh, I was doing some training uh, for the uh, Central Election Commission and journalists, so I had a chance to, uh, to, to focus a little bit on, on on the situation, it was not uh, only sp specific about the disinformation, but uh, I was just wondering if um, there are any concrete uh, uh, research uh, uh, types done uh, at the at the moment, uh, or this is more um, like a theoretical concept of what is happening. Thank you very much for your question, Mr. Kuzel. Actually, it's highly, um, so this information is very, um, let's say, very um, remarkable issue for both academic and uh, analytic research in Armenia currently, because currently we have a lot of uh, academics who are interested in uh, research of anthropological and um, psychological uh, impacts of this information on uh, Armenians, especially uh, young Armenians who are uh, very enthusiastic in political activi 
activation, engagement, political engagement, and also in uh, the you just usage, yeah, uh, a social media outlet for uh, for just uh, setting some communication between their um, between uh, between uh, different um, uh, social uh, ranges. So, but uh, back to um, a variety of situations in Armenia, which are um, important from uh, different perspectives. For example, when we uh, talk about an Agorno Karabakh war, it's something state and national, uh, something um, event that she, that is important from state and national uh, uh, cons, uh, perspectives. And uh, when we talk about uh, COVID-19, it's something global that also have peculiarities in Armenia as well. For example, we have a region center, which is also uh, the main activities of the center is dedicated of uh, dedicated to the um, uh, um, research and uh, the data, some data statistics about this information, uh, and especially about uh, social media uh, actors. For example, when we uh, talk about yeah, um, uh, uh, COVID nineteen, uh, we saw a set of uh, conspiracy theories and fake narratives in Armenia. The main are uh, regarding five G uh, towers, who uh, which are uh, the main, let's say, disseminators of the virus. And it's highly um, popular in Armenia uh, for that period. After we saw uh, the main uh, blame ar around Bill Gates Foundation, uh, Bill Gates, who, uh, let's say, is the main conspiracy theory that politi politicized uh, COVID-19. Uh, everything starts from the Bill Gates in Armenia, actually, with this conspiracy and continued with different uh, other conspiracies. And um, also uh, uh, one of the main popular narratives that uh, it's a, a, a war between uh, China and uh, economic war between China and USA and the um, uh, virus, uh, um, the main mean uh, that uh, used with, uh, with these uh, uh, actors who are warring with each other. It, uh, it's from the uh, conspiracy theories, but I uh, just uh, would like to share with you some statistics regarding, um, just a minute please, uh, some, some statistic regarding to the uh, usage of social media outlets, which are just copying and pasting information, but uh, it's not real, it's not based on professional activities, it's just um, somehow um, data that um, uh, we just, uh, some information that we um, uh, just uh, reading. Uh, again, uh, Region Center, um, Oh my God, where is it actually? I separated it in order to discuss it with you, but currently, yeah, here it is actually. Region Center uh, made uh, some research um, based on 100 social media uh, channels. And based on that channels, uh, we saw uh, such kind of statistics that uh, during coronavirus situation in Armenia, uh, the uh, uh, sixty-two percent of social media channels are copied uh, the information from different sources without making specific links to the authors and uh, to the main sources. Uh, sixty-two percent of the main. Uh, articles and information sources that we have actually uh, during the 2020 situation in Armenia. And 20% uh, uh, of this um, articles uh, have no uh, interaction with real uh, sources and have no, let's say, um, information which even can be reliable. So we uh, encounter with total disinformation. 
with uh, information that, uh, let's say, uh, not partially, but wholly uh, false. It's a very huge percentage when we uh, see, yeah, visually, um, and we see the main problem goes to the social media and the interaction of different outlets, uh, clickbait and mushroom sites, which just uh, want to gain some uh, clicks and uh, based on it, some financial profit, but um, along with it, they do not provide any um, uh, reliable or uh, professional information to uh, information consumers uh, virtually. Um, maybe this uh, can serve as an answer to your question. Thank you. Thank you very much. And um, I also wanted to just comment uh, on uh, on Edgar's uh, presentation. And I think it's uh, uh, super important to actually have a good understanding of these concepts. Um, and, and, you know, we have been working uh, for 25 years, actually, in the region. Uh, we, we started way long before uh before this um phenomenon of 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 disinformation has uh, become uh, so much recognized because uh you know many scholars already said before that uh, disinformation is is not a new phenomenon uh it's just mm -hmm. what change is the you know are the vectors of dissemination uh, and that's because of the advent of social media but i think uh sometimes we maybe hurry up uh, to focus on uh, on methods of uh, how we can monitor, but uh, I think about is essential is to understand these concepts um, because uh, they're 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 they are being used uh, uh, for many years, as you pointed out, uh, you know, uh, specifically by uh, you know by by Russia, uh, and 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 this is. Uh, something which really originated uh you know even centuries before and 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 they they are just yeah. uh, uh so it's like a new uh it's an old wine in a new bottle uh but yeah. this new, new bottle is really much much more effective because uh and that's the irony basically that they're actually using uh inventions uh that are coming from mainly from united states uh mm. are using yeah. In the battle against, um, you know, uh, well, main main social conservative ideas uh, are coming from United States social conservative uh, exactly. spaces. <laughs> exactly. So, but anyways, what what uh, I wanted to uh, sort of share with you uh, is our experience, and uh, and I think to uh, to a big extent. Uh, um, you know, it, it sort of um, it, it covers uh, the issues that you already uh, talked about. Uh, but uh, with with uh, my presentation, I also tried to go a little bit further. Uh, I think uh, we already understood these concepts, uh, you know, some time ago. And what we really tried, and when I say we, it's um, it's uh, my my organization uh, that I represent, Memo ninety eight. Um, you know, so we started uh, mainly as a as a as a media monitoring organization, uh, focusing uh, ma mainly at, uh, on 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 traditional media, and we developed a concept of monitoring, uh, uh, which uh, then we have uh, uh, we have uh, tested and used in uh, today in about sixty countries uh, of the world. Um, we have worked. Uh, in Armenia, in the framework of uh, OSC ODHR election observation missions, um, that uh, methodology that we developed uh, now has been also used uh, uh, inside uh, such organizations as OSC ODIR, European Union, uh, UN, uh, NDI, uh, IRI, many other groups, and um, and so we have been doing this. Uh, uh, with these organizations or uh, separately, depending on, on the actual uh, concrete project. But uh, those white dots are uh, some of these countries where we worked. Um, and then uh, just to give you a bit more about us. Um, so at the moment, uh, there are like five different pillars based on which we work. Uh, so media monitoring, I already mentioned, uh, elections, 
we are primarily uh, focusing on elections, but but uh, in the context, for example, of disinformation, we have also done uh, work on on gender related disinformation. Uh, we have also focused on uh, on uh, on uh, the coverage of minorities, um, and um, we still believe that the best response to disinformation is good quality journalism. So we we still do uh, projects which try to support uh, good quality journalism which basically obviously media literacy and digital media literacy which is one of those areas that this project focuses on uh, i mean your project uh, is certainly part of that and uh, obviously i mentioned minorities and uh, and and the stereotyping of minorities so those couple of pictures that you see i mean one is actually from our project in ukraine uh this was um uh, this was already after the, uh, well, uh, after the, the 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 sort of first invasion happened after 2014, after the annexation of Crimea, and the project focused on on internally displaced people, um, and uh, and uh, in uh, the other one uh, we focused on Roma, uh, and in both cases we we tried to use multimedia journalism to. To give uh, the ability uh, for the minorities to be able to present their own stories, which again I think is one way how to tackle uh, the issue of uh, disinformation. Um, I want to give you uh, a bit of uh, a story of our Slovakia recent elections, uh, which took place on the thirtieth of uh, September, and uh, just to give you uh, some idea about. Um, how this information is used and misused in Slovakia and also the role of social media, particularly Facebook. So uh, in uh, 2022, uh, during the, the World's Value Survey, uh, which Slovakia is part of, uh, when uh, people were asked about their confidence in elections, about 59% of Slovaks said that they trusted the uh, the election system, the electoral um you know the institutions that uh, conduct the elections so which was not uh, the highest number in comparison with the other countries of the european union but uh, but still relatively high given the low uh, trust of slovaks into institutions which i will speak a little bit later um in february uh, 2023 so some 6 months before our elections uh the leader of one extremist right uh, wing party basically disseminated a video on Facebook, basically uh, saying, you know, we are preparing a plan how to stop the steal, uh, stop the falsification of elections. Uh, very much uh, uh, similar to what uh, Donald Trump did in, in the States. Uh, the only difference was that uh, while Donald Trump uh, focused mainly on the voting by mail, uh, which uh, made some sense in the context of the COVID-19 pandemic and the fact that uh, more Americans were actually uh, voting uh, via mail. Uh, in our case, uh, there was actually not even, uh, there, there were basically no grounds uh, to say that there is any uh, sort of preparation uh, because our system, uh, without going into details, uh, Political parties could nominate nominate two representatives to all three levels of election administration. So they can uh, they can check uh, pretty much anything. And so talking about uh, someone you know fixing the results or whatever is really uh, uh, out of out of question. Uh, nevertheless, uh, the main idea of this was not to. Uh, was not to actually uh, somehow prevent uh, falsification, but it was part of the electoral campaign, uh, basically uh, purposefully done on social media, generating, uh, okay, these are some, oh, I mean, the figures were that uh, uh, there were over 100,000 uh, people that actually viewed the video. Um, it's a 5.5 million uh, country, uh, so the the this disinformation spread quite uh, quite rapidly, and the result was that uh, in in a in couple of months in April, uh, 
about 50, almost 50% 50 of Slovaks actually were afraid that the elections will be manipulated. So that just gives you a picture of, um, of how effective uh, this communication uh, through social media is in Slovakia, how much it affects. Obviously, I could share with you uh, the numbers. I mean, still people uh, get most of the information from television, but uh, the share of social media, I mean, in, in 2020, it was something like 50% television, 20-something uh, percent social media. This time, it's really social media are getting higher, higher. Uh, it's not, uh, it's it's still not exactly the same, but, uh, but I've seen some uh, surveys which actually show that uh, Facebook was neck to neck with with television. Uh, so it's really uh, the role as uh, as as also I think Victoria mentioned is is really rising and uh, and therefore uh, you know I completely agree with your points from your presentation that there is a need to to have a better regulation of this. Uh, so for us, um, this uh, basically there were two main aspects. Uh, which we decided to focus on. One was, uh, as election experts, we, we we believe that we could contribute to this discussion of uh, whether or not uh, the elections could really be manipulated and, and help to protect the integrity of elections in, uh, in this area, which again was mainly information environment. I mean, this had very little to do with uh, the actual uh, electoral uh, institutions i mean they we 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 basically had no suspicion that uh, the previous government was was basically preparing some manipulations of the elections but certainly the political actors are the the most uh, important disseminators of this information in this in this country uh, so we decided to uh, focus on uh, protecting the integrity of elections and then second thing um uh, this was something new for us. We also believe that uh, uh, that it, there is a need to because what is the main um, what is the main uh, goal of those who spread this information? It is to create passive and cynical societies. It is to kill activism. It is to have the end result of what we can see uh, in Russia uh, these days that there is a. Uh, they're, they're, they basically killed the civil society, uh, they killed uh, opposition, um, they, they killed uh, independent media. So it is basically uh, to, to form this type of passivity. And so we thought that uh, the best way to tackle this is really to mobilize uh, voters. And, and then this mobilization obviously uh, should not be done uh, without basically having some uh, very concrete uh, uh, survey results. So we, we basically decided to focus on mobilizing first and second time voters. Uh, so the segment was uh, between 18 to, uh, to 24, 25 years old uh, that we decided to, to mobilize. Maybe a few things about this mobilization and then also about, about the monitoring. So um, we we used to have this um, uh, special info uh, elections portal, which is called Info Elections, um, and um, we ran, ran this project until 2016, and this was like a full uh, comprehensive uh, portal about uh, different types, different aspects of elections, focusing on the campaign, political parties, media agency news, uh, public opinion polls, uh, the, the election management body, uh, legal help for voters, legislation, and, and, and media monitoring. Uh, but uh, for these elections, we were also thinking like, uh, if we are mobilizing young people, usually what you hear from many uh, Slovaks here is that, okay, um, you know, I could come to vote, but I don't know whom to vote for. All politicians are the same. They all steal and blah, blah, blah. So we thought that uh, uh, running this voting advice application, uh, which is basically um, a project where you have to answer from 25 to, I don't know, 40 uh, different questions. And then um, the application gives you 
what is the best match with which political party? Uh, in other words, uh, we uh, we basically approached uh, all running uh, political parties, uh, 25. We send them the list of questions on different issues, such as economy, foreign policy, you know, but also local politics, you know, how to deal with, uh, I don't know, climate changes, environment, blah, blah, blah. And then uh, we uh, included these responses in this application. So uh, you as a voter just come to our website. You can choose uh, the application that you want to fill out. So there was a special one for young voters, uh, but there was also for all voters. Uh, there was also uh, something what we called inventory of voting, which is basically how MPs voted on different issues. Um, and uh, the idea was, again, uh, you know, try to engage mainly young people uh, because they are more keen on using certain applications on the Internet uh, and forcing them to think about different uh, approaches from different political parties. Uh, so not to say that, uh, you know, I cannot choose, but but rather, you know, get engaged uh, with this application and, and see what is your best match. And then, uh, you know, of course, you don't have to vote for whichever party will come first. Uh, you can you can uh, you can choose um, uh, still whatever party you want. But uh, it is a way how to push people to think more about issues, not only about personalities, which which we thought was uh, was very important. Um, it was. All, it was um, um, it wouldn't be successful without a huge social media campaign which we did with uh, some experts from UK uh, from Zinc network and so here uh, if we expected that around 10,000 people would use uh, our voting advice application for young voters it was 10 times more it was 107 thousand uh, almost 108 thousand people who actually, uh, f uh, from this young uh, category who actually came uh, and filled out uh, this quiz, uh, completed and received uh, some answers. Uh, we got uh, overall more than 12 million of impressions, uh, 387,000 meaningful views on, of our website. So uh, th this was uh, quite unexpected, but... Uh, it was done uh, in combination of uh, uh, influencers that uh, I saw on Victoria's slide. We worked with influencers. We uh, we basically uh, were lucky to have uh, uh, at least a few influencers who were really pushing uh, our content. And then we also had a quite significant uh, a paid uh, online campaign, uh, which we did and which was very targeted uh, where we used uh, some surveys uh, to, to focus on what these young people cared about. And then we tried to engage them exactly on those issues that uh, they presented as, as important. So again, uh, thanks to this uh, uh, sort of professionally run online campaign, we were able to actually generate a lot of, uh, lot of uh, interactions, a lot of uh, views um, we started with uh, two uh, professionally made um, videos uh, that got over 100,000 views on on our YouTube channel and I should say that uh, memo is certainly not uh, not uh, so popular or was not so popular on social media uh, but this campaign really uh, proved that um, you know micro targeting and using paid uh, online support uh, can really achieve uh, quite quite significant uh, results so uh, here are some more more figures but but that's basically a little bit about this uh, uh, this this application um, we were also part of another the biggest uh, uh, mobilization campaign uh, which uh, was called to uh, study uh, I want to stay here we were among the four main initiators of this campaign. And, and this uh, basically, uh, I will just give you one concrete figure. I mean, we organized uh, online and offline events, uh, more than uh, 
uh, I mean, around 280 different events, uh, concerts, uh, you know, uh, debates with uh, with popular people, with social influencers. And so uh, we managed to increase this participation, particularly in this category of first and second time voters by 16%. So if in April, only 52% of them said that they were going to vote. In uh, in reality, it was 68%. And we believe that this increased participation actually prevented the, the worst possible outcome, which was the illiberal forces, which actually won the elections and were able to create uh, the ruling coalition, but only got simple majority. Uh, they have 79 members of the parliament. Uh, and uh, 76, uh, I mean, 75 is 50%. So they need, they need 76%, uh, sorry, 76 MPs uh, to, to vote, uh, to pass the laws and, and to have the simple majority. So if uh, we believe that if it were not for these mobilization efforts, uh, they would probably get the constitutional majority similar to what Viktor Orban has in Hungary. And then uh, they could probably uh, push uh, most of the changes, um, you know, without um, or, or they could really change the electoral system, for example, and, and make some uh, significant uh, harm uh, to the democratic institutions. They are still doing it now, but I think uh, it's more difficult only with the simple majority. Very quickly about the other part, about the monitoring, because I believe that that's probably something that uh, you are more more interested in. So uh, I actually uh, I actually uh, wrote uh, a, a toolkit, a media monitoring toolkit, which uh, which uh, is is basically available. Uh, I will share it uh, after my presentation to the chat. Uh, but there you can actually see uh, my experience of more than twenty years in in media monitoring. Uh, this one is concretely based on my one of the biggest monitoring projects I did was in Ukraine in 2019, uh, which focused on uh, on traditional media, on online media, on social media, and also on gender uh, monitoring. So uh, this uh, I will I will share with you um, now uh, very briefly about uh, the way how we do this monitoring. Uh, so. It's sort of uh, consists of four different stages. Um, first of all, obviously, we need to uh, find uh, some uh, some effective tool uh, uh, to uh, to record. So for traditional media, this is not so difficult. For social media, uh, this is much more complex because uh, you need to have uh, good access to the data, and so for social media we have been using our access to crowdangle uh which is uh, a tool developed uh, by i mean which is a tool owned by meta uh in 2017 they bought this uh, this tool and are currently allowing some uh, ac academia people some think tanks uh, some ngos and some media outlets to to have a better access to their data uh, through api um the sad side of this story is that they are not onboarding any new uh, people to get this access, and and it's for more than a year. It's been under, I mean, they're not investing anymore in in this uh, tool. Uh, so uh, we fear that at some stage they will just completely uh, discontinue uh, providing this access. Uh, but uh, luckily, we are not there yet, so we are still able to use it. And I will show you some concrete examples of how this can be used. Uh, then uh, the second stage is uh, timing and coding and uh, using different variables uh, of what is the unit of analysis, what is your specific focus. Uh, the third aspect is basically when, when you are analyzing this data. And of course, the fourth aspect is, is when, you, when you monitor. Uh, so very briefly, uh, uh, the methodology consists of a quantitative analysis where we measure uh, such variables as uh, time or space, uh, the tone, the sentiment analysis, uh, the direct, indirect uh, speech in case we are doing this on electronic media uh, and, and many other aspects. Uh, 
uh, we uh, basically, uh, when we do the political monitoring or monitoring of political pluralism, uh, the main focus is basically to what extent uh, uh, different uh, political players are able to, to have access uh, to media. So we focus on, on, on the president, government, ruling coalition, and the opposition. Uh, this is uh, when it comes to the basics of this uh, monitoring. And then obviously, and more and more with the social media, we focus on topics, subtopics, and narratives. Uh, and this is uh, done in connection with concrete topics such as uh, we did monitoring of COVID-19 uh, disinformation, but we also monitored, uh, uh, for example, the, the, the disinformation narrative in, narratives in connection with the war in Ukraine, uh, but also in the context of, of elections. Uh, as for the measurement systems, I mean, in online media, we use Excel, <laughs> excuse me, uh, we use uh, square centimeters in uh, print media. On television, we mainly use seconds. Um, when it comes to the differences, there are differences between, um, obviously, between the uh, social media monitoring and the other uh, types. Um, we try to analyze, uh, you know, what is the impact and what are the threats to electoral integrity? Uh, what is uh, technically feasible? Uh, as again, you need to have uh, human and financial resources for these type of projects. Uh, and then you need to have that access to data. So for example, for the last elections, we also monitored uh, Telegram uh, because the crowd angle gives, gives us access to Facebook and Instagram, uh, YouTube uh, and TikTok. Uh, I mean, for YouTube, you can, uh, you can get relatively normal access through some commercial platforms such as Newsweek, which we are using. Uh, but TikTok is uh, is uh, is very difficult uh, to get access to uh, as they do not provide um, uh, this open access through API. With Telegram, it is possible. We use Teleton uh, to get that uh, access. And then uh, we used our, uh, our programmer just programmed the scripts uh, through which we were able to, uh, to, to, to get that access to the data. Um, I think what is very important at the beginning of this type of uh, social media monitoring is to have uh, good data on the popularity of these platforms. And so for these, we usually use uh, this um, research, which is, which is done annually. Uh, by we are social, uh, so uh, this basically uh, gives you uh, on on every country where we have worked, um, you know, a very specific data. I mean, this one was um, was in Libya where I was doing some training uh, uh, recently. So I look at uh, the overall uh, numbers for the population, and then I I look at uh, the numbers for social media users and then uh, I usually uh, am able to get uh, like how many of these social media users are actually using different platforms such as for example Facebook which is uh, the most popular platform in Libya and and so my design is according to those numbers uh, so this is about uh, the the crowd angle and also one technique that we are using in this uh, social media monitoring is called network mapping. So uh, we are able to use um, uh, this um, data that we get from, from Facebook. Uh, we are able to, uh, to actually uh, visualize uh, the way how these narratives are being spread on Facebook because monitoring this manually is, is impossible. I mean, in traditional media, you can watch, you can choose the segments uh, like primetime news, uh, and you can measure that uh, exact segment. In social media, this is uh, not possible because uh, there is such a huge amount of information which is being disseminated. So uh, therefore, we are forced to use this, uh, this type of tools. Uh, so for, for the network mapping, what we do is we first gather the data through CrowdAngle. And when I say data, for example, we are interested to see how a certain keyword is spread. 
or we are interested how a certain piece of disinformation is spread on Facebook. So I can put that URL or keyword in CrowdTangle and I can gather the data uh, that I want, uh, meaning like I can choose the period of a year, you know, how this word or this uh, concrete URL was disseminated uh, on Slovak Facebook or any other country. We have global access, so we can do this in Armenia as well. Now, you have a lot, you have tons of data. You have uh, sometimes uh, over 300,000 entries uh, in Excel sheet. And this is not also easy to, to navigate, but if you are using the network mapping, which is basically using certain tools to visualize this data, you can get uh, something like this. You know, here, this is a, this is a very good uh, way how you can demonstrate how these uh, disinformation actors, how the disinformation media are working together with the political party uh, the political party here is Smer, which won the elections. Uh, this orange is one of the main disinformation actors, you know, and so you can basically study the correlations, you know, between these uh, these uh, uh, actors. Uh, this is another uh, big uh, publication which is known for disseminating disinformation. So uh, these nodes and edges basically give you an idea of these interactions and how much this information is pushed. Uh, 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 I will finish with a very, a very concrete uh, uh, case study where I use this network mapping to actually understand the sort of popularity of one uh, member of parliament on Slovak Facebook. So uh, this year in January, you know, we were looking at the numbers uh, and so what we could do is basically we can pull out the data on, on, on who is the most popular politician on Slovak Facebook. Suddenly, you know, this guy who is uh, another member of this extreme extreme right uh, party uh, was, was the first uh, who was generating most of the interactions. And uh, it didn't make much sense because he was a, a virtually unknown a member, uh, he was actually, sorry, I take it back, he was not a member of parliament, he was only assistant to a member of parliament, yeah? So virtually Mr. Nobody, who is suddenly dominating uh, on, 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 on the Facebook. So I decided, okay, so these are the numbers that we get from CrowdTango. Uh, so here you, you can see that, uh, you know, Slovak politicians on Facebook from uh, the 1st January until 3rd March, in number of interactions. Interactions meaning the views, the likes, you know, the the shares, comments, and everything. And so suddenly it was, uh, it, I mean, uh, Robert Fico is, is the four-time prime minister, so very known politician. Uh, so for him to be like the second, it makes certain sense. Milan Uhrig is the chair of this ultra-right party. Again, uh, understandable. Uh, because these ultra-right politicians are more popular on Facebook. They are using this tool. They know how to use it. So, um, but why why would be a, a, an assistant, you know, to member member of parliament uh, leading uh, this? Uh, that was not uh, clear. So I <clears throat> started uh, analyzing a little bit his profile on Facebook, and so. Uh, there was an article in uh, one newspaper saying that he started getting a lot of popularity when he started circulating these uh, uh, information videos uh, about uh, uh, about the war in Ukraine. Uh, but um, he was not. I mean, these were mainly this information coming from um, from members of European Parliament uh, and also from. Uh, Republicans, some Republicans from United States. So not necessarily like, uh, uh, you know, promoting the, the Kremlin uh, propaganda per se, because here uh, the number of uh, Russian speakers is not as high as in, as in Armenia. Uh, so here it is uh, more effective for these people to actually circulate this type of uh, narratives coming. I mean, they are basically using the same narratives but it's just different actors who are promoting them, not not uh, Peskov, not uh, not uh, the Russian Telegram channels uh, always, but um, but sometimes it's it's this. And so 
I was able to see that, uh, you know, the number of his followers was was relatively low, uh, but it started to raise uh, exactly like from this point when he started sharing this video. So that was uh, that was uh, more or less confirmation. But still, uh, we have many of such accounts which basically really share the same disinformation narrative. So it still was not making uh, all the sense which I needed. So uh, he was sharing, for example, the the videos of this guy, uh, a former uh, a former senator from Republican Party, uh, basically uh, saying, you know, that Ukraine has already lost the the war. I mean, this was in. A, uh, July thirtieth. Uh, this was shortly before the 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 first Ukrainian counteroffensive, which took place in September uh, in twenty twenty two. Or this uh, member of uh, European Parliament, uh, Mick Wallace, uh, who is also known for circulating this uh, this disinformation uh, on 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 Facebook. Um, so I only was able to get a full sense of what contributed to this popularity when I did the network mapping. Uh, so I put uh, the name of this guy into Facebook and I gathered the data for a year. And uh, when I use this uh, uh, open source uh, Gephi uh, for network mapping, I suddenly saw that this guy is mentioned uh, by certain Facebook groups, which are not necessarily based in Slovakia, but in, in the Czech Republic. Uh, you know, Slovakia and Czech Republic, we are still very close uh, using a language which is understandable. And so I was able to track that this guy actually started his disinformation career in, in Czech Republic by posting to this Czech Facebook public groups. And, uh, you know, he started generating a lot of interactions that actually came from Czechia. Uh, from Czech Republic. Uh, so this was uh, uh, clearly, uh, I mean, uh, when when then I followed his account and I started also some manual checking, I suddenly saw that, uh, you know, the guy is getting 50% of his interactions from, from, from the Czech Republic. So this is just to give you some very concrete uh, uh, evidence of uh, how these tools could be used and uh, how you can uh, use uh, them to actually map uh, where does the uh, support come from, you know, where does where do the interaction come from, how these actors support each other, uh, and, and this is exactly uh, what we have been doing. So I think I will stop it here. I have many more things to share with you, but uh, I think uh, at this stage, you know, th this will be uh, this will be uh, sufficient and uh, maybe, uh, you know, I'm happy to engage in, in a discussion, uh, you know, of uh, whether or not uh, such uh, monitoring could be useful. So in your context uh, and, 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 and also obviously uh, I can talk a little bit about um, the, the plans that we have uh, uh, for the future elections where this combination of monitoring uh, the narratives and then uh, making an informed mobilization campaign uh, we will be using uh, also in the upcoming European Parliament elections, in the presidential elections, and also uh, probably in a four years time, uh, because, uh, and that's the last thing I will mention, uh, we really uh, study the Polish elections in Poland, uh, after eight years of uh, the peace government, uh, which uh, had very similar uh, sort of illiberal actors, you know, trying to dismantle democratic institutions such as independent judiciary, uh, independent media, uh, they lost. Uh, I mean, they actually won the elections, but they are not able to form the coalition and the mobilization of first and second time voters and also women uh, played a very crucial role. So we are putting together uh, a sort of coalition of NGOs that uh, will focus on, on similar issues here, uh, repli replicating the successful uh, experiences, plus adding this, uh, this uh, gender 
component uh, gender mob i mean mobilization of women there as well so sorry for the long uh, uh you know for the wrong presentation but uh, obviously happy now to talk and discuss with you mm. uh, thank you very much indeed uh, i hope you can share the presentation file as well with us and uh, uh, before i had an opportunity to talk to you like one on one about this uh, monitoring tools that you use and uh, perhaps uh, we can uh, plan a project which uh, could let us to use some of the tools here as well or and uh, can involve some counties from the region if possible because some uh, comparison is also useful and what i thought about some points of your presentation against some uh, methods that I used are very similar to bringing an example of some former American official who spread some pro-Russian messages. This is something what that happens in Armenia on social networks from time to time. Then it doesn't bring very much results, but still they try it from time to time with and in our case, it's a bit uh, funny or absurd because they don't even bother to make translation into Armenian, so they just uh, show it with some Russian subtitles. And so it appears on some Russian website, and then somebody starts reposting it here. And uh, I wanted to ask about some uh, how the state in Slovakia acts against uh, this information on social networks. So there is this uh, the group run by the police, Hoxia I think, and uh, what else and is available and uh, how effective those methods are. Methods are. Mm. Yes, thank you very much. And um, that's... Um... These are very good points. I mean, we have been discussing this joint project uh, already for some time uh, with uh, possibly with Georgia. And I think, uh, you know, it, it sort of uh, using these tools would be uh, really uh, good and possible in all three countries. Uh, uh, because uh, I think the what we see uh, is that uh, many of these narratives really are at least the there are similar groups of narratives which are being used uh, there may be slightly different uh, applications uh, according to what works in a specific country uh, for example it was clear that um, the type of uh, disinformation disseminated for example in the in 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 the previous elections in france where macron won for the first time um, it simply did not work uh, of uh, you know, playing with the card of, uh, I don't know, LGBTI plus, uh, I mean, doesn't simply work with the, with the secular French society where, you know, there, this is, uh, the, I mean, the, the rights are not uh, um, somehow disputed as much as uh, in more conservative societies, such as, uh, I don't know, Georgia or, or, or Slovakia. So, so, but uh, the, the, there are very common roots of, of this disinformation. I mean, one thing that uh, seems to be working everywhere is basically that um, if there is a piece of truth in, in any of these messages, I mean, then, uh, you know, it can be actually exploited uh, even more effectively. So you mentioned these, uh, these US um, officials as, as being used uh, sometimes for these uh, more domestic actors. That's exactly what is happening also uh, nowadays, with this new new government in Slovakia, they also started this campaign uh, to to pass the foreign agent law, and they keep re referring to an old law which was adopted by U.S. Congress, uh, you know, uh, in in um, during the Second World War, uh, which was basically to sort of uh, I mean the, the 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 main aim was was very different from labeling uh, NGOs that are getting uh, foreign funding uh, 
uh, but it was used uh, back then against spies, basically. So, but anyways, they are. Uh, these are the type of details which these actors do not pay attention to, and they just keep saying, "Okay, well, in why in the US they have they have the same foreign agent law. Why shouldn't we have one in Slovakia, for example?" Um, and I, also, I forgot to mention before I touch on the on the last uh, question that um, we had uh, a first time uh, appearance of a deep fake uh, in our elections. It was. Uh, deepfake audio, which was disseminated also during the moratorium, the same as uh, this disinformation about Macron uh, was also disseminated on the eve of elections on, on, on Friday, when um, under the strict uh, French rules, uh, the, the mainstream uh, or the, 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 the traditional media were asked not to report on this. Uh, which I think is a is obviously a problem that uh, we should probably um, uh, synchronize uh, the our our legal norms with the twenty first century, and uh, I don't think it makes any sense to have moratorium, uh, you know, in the in the period of uh, social media or, or internet uh, because uh, it just prevents people from actually receiving uh, information from trustworthy sources and leaves us uh, with the uh, internet or in the worst case with uh, these uh, social media or disinformation actors who are basically planning their attacks exactly <laughs> for that reason uh, on the eve of elections. In our case, um, and, and that's partly why I'm using this deepfake is because I believe that uh, that our institutions really did a very good job. Uh, you, Armen, mentioned this um, uh, this uh, concrete uh, website. Well, I had an honor to actually work with uh, with this website. Uh, sorry, with the Facebook uh, profile. Uh, let me just share very quickly uh, uh, because this is really or was, unfortunately. <laughs> Uh, one of the most successful uh, projects done by any uh, institutions in Slovakia. Uh, as you can see, it has uh, 151,000 followers. Uh, and um, so what I did was basically, um, we did uh, a series of, uh, of videos. Uh, this is me. Uh, we we shot sixteen videos, and uh, these videos were basically. I I apologize. Um, uh, the, I will not play the the sound because then it will be difficult for you to hear me. But um, these sixteen videos basically focused on, uh, 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 you know, refuting this um, idea that uh, the the elections could be manipulated. Uh, you know, giving examples from other countries. And so uh, it was, uh, there were a series of, of these and, and, and uh, you know, they had quite, uh, quite good um, sort of visibility, uh, specifically the first ones. I think in retrospect, um, I would not uh, shoot all 16 videos at a certain time like we did in, in June. I would probably try to uh, do it uh, you know more to reflect uh, what was happening, but especially those first ones, uh, you know, uh, responded to those things that were happening. But uh, the unfortunate, uh, sad story about uh, this uh, account is that uh, after the, you know, after the the elections, now the the person who is the admin admin to the website or to the Facebook profile um, uh, has left uh, the police uh, the the new minister objected uh, uh, and tried to interfere with the editorial freedom of this person who basically comes from uh, uh, from media he used to work for uh, a boulevard type of media and so he had a very good understanding of how uh, you know how these algorithms work and and that's why he did this um, amazing project uh, you know, where police was really able to identify very quickly if there was any disinformation spread and uh, 
And so in, including with this deep fake uh, audio, the police reacted very quickly. Um, you know, uh, they uh, informed, um, uh, they, they, they posted a post about this. Then the Facebook fact checker, uh, the official fact checker, AFP uh, produced um, an, uh, an, a sort of article which was uh, disseminated on internet, uh, not not on traditional media, but on internet, yes. And um, and then we also sp spoke with Meta, including myself. Uh, you know, I very quickly uh, uh, reached out, and also the, the the media regulator reached out. Uh, very quickly escalated it with Meta, and Meta then slowed down at least the the reach of this uh, concrete deepfake, <laughs> which obviously you can ask why they didn't take it down, because it's Meta. Uh, but uh, but uh, but still, I think the to answer the question, I think the work of the institutions, uh, and then I also should mention my work with the Ministry of Interior. Uh, I worked with them. I helped them to design methodology of monitoring. I also uh, did some e-learning uh, with them. So this was really uh, some important part of the institutional uh, work. Uh, unfortunately, all these people, most of these people are now leaving. Uh, so uh, whatever was built in these three years, and I should say that... Uh, there was um, there was still lacking political will. Even the previous government uh, was not uh, uh, was not supporting this politically. So the the, mo the money came from uh, EU projects. This was uh, because skillful managers were able to write uh, proper proposals. The European Union decided to support this financially. So there were monitoring units which were working uh, under the Ministry of Interior and the Ministry of Defense, uh, and the, the Prime Minister's office. This is all now, uh, unfortunately, going to be history. And the irony is that those who were identified as the main spreaders or disseminators of this information won the elections. So now they are at the driver's seat. So it's quite understandable that for them, uh, this is uh, somehow revenge or uh, vendetta, you know, against these people who were basically just doing their job. Um, so yes, this is uh, quite unfortunate that uh, the state has been building these, um, you know, these uh, these resources, and uh, uh, for the first time, it was not only the civil society but also the state having so some kind of capacity. Uh, to react, uh, and this is now in, endangered because of this new uh, administration is right, like doing really everything to uh, to kill uh, this type of uh, ability of the state to defend itself against the Russian propaganda. And I should say that uh, if you look at the the the, the surveys, uh, you will see that we are m the most vulnerable in the Visegrad 4 and, and, and with Bulgaria, uh, the most vulnerable in the European Union. So it's it's really, you know, it would be detrimental for us to continue, but uh, now it's the reverse trend is, is the truth. So sorry for the long uh, response. I know that we are getting shorter of time, but, but, uh, but I wanted to give you the full picture. Uh, uh, thank you. The, the, there were some important I think points. You are, and, I cannot... uh, uh, thank you. You made some important points. It was very interesting, actually. Can you and hear, Ar Armen? I cannot hear. Yeah, yes, uh, I I hear. I also hear. I cannot hear you at all. Uh, let me oh. <laughs> maybe get in and out uh, very quickly because I cannot hear you for some reason maybe after showing that video Okay, now I think I can hear you. Sorry about that. 
So can uh, you hear us? Yes. Yes. So uh, thank you for making some interesting points. And now uh, we have some little time, still little time remaining. So maybe the colleagues can now ask questions that they would be interested in. So Victoria, uh, I have two questions. Okay. To Mr. Kozel. Uh, first question, uh, mainly. Who votes for illiberal forces, for uh, far-right populistic forces in Slovakia? Uh, and the second question, uh, did you reveal uh, the main, the biggest uh, far-right populistic narrative uh, in Slovakia? Thank you very much. Um for both questions. Um, it's a bit more complex to, to say who works uh, for these illiberal forces. It's a combination of uh, um, of the state not defending itself against the, the, the Kremlin propaganda. So for years, this was a, uh, this was a, a very uh, sort of a good ground for these actors you know to start building the networks here and so the networks consist of uh of disinformation media of uh of of some uh, uh concrete actors uh former politicians or you know even some people from academia that uh, decided to build their popularity on social media and uh when i say the network has been built there is Obviously, there is some evidence. There was some smoking gun evidence of a Russian uh, military attaché actually giving money uh, to one of these actors. Uh, so that was actually uh, shot by by Slovak police and and revealed. Uh, but uh, but other than this, obviously, we th this is very difficult to dig out the evidence. I mean, we can only uh, use the, the the open source research. I mean, the the state obviously has. Uh, more information, but uh, for our open re open source uh, evidence, we can only look at how they cooperate. But uh, but this is mainly, I would say, you know the and not only right wing politicians. I, sh I that's my mistake. I should have said that uh, this uh, extremism has been now joined by what used to be more traditional parties, because uh, Prime Minister Fico's party used to be considered to be a more traditional party. Now it clearly went to this extreme uh, sort of, uh, you know, extreme area, the same as Fidesz in Hungary. And then uh, it sort of cannibalized the voters, this ultra-right party that I showed you, uh, you know, the, the example from, they, they didn't make it to the parliament because their voters were uh, stolen by, by, the, by the ruling party uh, because of yeah. the extremist narratives uh, yeah. But it's a, it's definitely a, a cooperation between disinformation media, between these politicians who are using this irresponsibly, be them right wing or the more traditional, and then obviously some useful idiots which uh, basically still uh, support uh, you know these pro Kremlin narratives. So it's it's really a big network, and it's very difficult to to sort of uh, fight them. On, on on the internet because this is this has been built long time ago and they have huge amounts of supporters and followers uh so it's it's very easy for them and and final point uh to say that many things come through telegram yeah. uh, as uh, they initiate through telegram but then telegram is still not uh, so uh, popular as for example in ukraine or russia yeah. Uh, so it's still mainly Facebook that it's the the message is is being uh, um, you know uh, promoted. And also, what about the electorate of far right populists? Oh, these are mainly uh, rural. Who votes for them? Yeah. yeah, it's mainly rural areas. It's mainly uh, people mm -hmm. uh, of age, if I can put it mm -hmm. that way, uh, pensioners, elderly people. And it's um, well, it's a good question. What is there for them? Because uh, they are being tricked all the time. Uh, they are being promised, uh, and now this is very much uh, exactly the Trump 
scenario in Slovakia that uh, Trump made these promises and now the the ruling coalition is uh, is trying to fulfill their promises they are not communicating with anyone else but their voters no one else so they are delivering the 13th uh, salary uh, sort of uh, social benefit salary mm -hmm. for pensioners they are um, delivering uh, you know some um, some other uh, which will cost huge amount of money uh, which uh, our public finances are in crisis but nevertheless, they are still uh, delivering these uh, these promises. Uh, for the for the second question, uh, yeah, the biggest narrative. Of the biggest right narrative. See, this was this was super interesting, um, and this monitoring gives you this opportunity to actually do it uh, over a longer period of time because our election almost had no one single biggest narrative. Uh, uh -huh. it, what was what was the most interesting finding was that the narratives were changing may, maybe every two weeks. Uh, so oh. they mm. would start with, uh, there was this trip of experts, I was included uh, to Brussels and, and then they made a big uh, disclosure, you know, how we went to Brussels, you know, to complain about the opposition here. And, you know, that we are traitors. And for two weeks, it was like uh, in the public domain. They were asking the general prosecutor to start uh, the proceedings against us, you know, as, as against traitors and blah, blah, blah. But then it just disappeared, you know, and, mm. and the same about these manipulative elections, you know, it, it was longer there. But then, uh, you know, after the elections, no one was really talking about uh, the elections being because they achieved their results. Uh, and so there was bigger Very situational narratives here yeah. exactly and uh, maybe migrants was uh was more prominent but mainly by the end of uh, of the election cycle they very quickly used the issue of migrants to 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 threaten even though we had no migrants and no one wants to stay in slovakia because of uh, our uh, not very tolerant uh, society here vis-a-vis -vis minorities lgbti plus i don't know ukrainians you name it uh so uh yeah there is, this is an interesting uh, outcome of the monitoring that uh, they were no not a single mm -hmm. uh, but but there is a combination of similar narratives that are being used in 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 Armenia I'm sure and yeah. it depends on how these people really work well with the public opinion uh, polls and they really are excellent in uh, in in uh, utilizing and and exploiting uh you know the the public uh, uh, so that's why they're effective in populism, and it's it's going to be extremely difficult to uh, to really uh, come up with effective counter policies uh, because again they are uh, Mr. Fitzo is really brilliant in in the way how he how he can read the public opinion uh, and how he can react to it and and they have learned how to use social media so he's probably not as genius as Trump is. In that yeah. respect, but he's quite uh, he's quite capable and and uh, in 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 doing this. So I think Victoria, now it's your turn. If you have any questions, yeah, yes, I have a question. Uh, I'm just uh, interested in your professional uh, opinion regarding to fact checking as a tool, uh, which is highly used, especially in Armenia, uh, to oppose this information or any type of false information. For example, in Armenia, uh, no matter how brilliant you conduct everything regarding to beating this disinformation, uh, you will have uh, uh, good arguments, you will prepare um, very good um, content uh, based on the fact checking and uh, investigative journalism. But um, it's nothing uh, uh, when we see uh, how this information can influence, uh, can have negative impacts on people. So uh, the efforts uh, which are uh, put to uh, make this fact checking um, by uh, several organizations in our media organizations in Armenia um, is not functioning well. So uh, what is the situation in your country and based on your professional approach? Uh, very, very good question. Thank you uh, for, for this. Um, yeah, I have to say that... Um, 
I'm I'm I mean I think we have learned by now that uh, fact checking on its own is not sufficient, you know, because uh, and and I just went to get uh, this book uh, to show you, which I which I read, which I highly recommend. It's sort of uh, it's George Lakoff uh, book. Don't think of an elephant. It's a, it's a brilliant book about. Uh, uh, about framing of the narratives uh, in US, uh, it, it it really helps you to understand, uh, you know, why Republicans are so efficient. Uh, because I I had a chance to study in the states, and um, and I, you know, before the 2016 elections, I I was never able to predict that uh, Trump can actually be successful in getting. Uh, the votes of uh, minorities uh, who are becoming majorities, such as uh, Afro-American voters or Hispanic voters or uh, or women, uh, but this book actually gives you the answer. You know, it's really about uh, the framing of the debate, and I think the Republicans are very good in framing the debate. And uh, that's unfortunately what I think. Also, I mean, I think obviously fact checking is is still important. I think we still need uh, good media to do this uh, professional job. But uh, I think we need to be much more creative. I think uh, uh, because uh, the the very uh, the, the research that we are getting is that, uh, you know, people are hardly interested to, to read some fact checked uh, material if it's just an article or something. So that's why we, we try to be much more creative in uh, the what i would call pre-banking in in uh, in in in, uh, in um, understanding uh, what these players uh, are doing and 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 in informing in advance uh, and and being able to 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 actually take some uh, you know more more creative uh, uh, more more creative uh, approaches to this i would just say one one thing that storytelling i think is 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 really seems to be uh, effective uh, using humor you know uh, getting people engaged i mean using uh, using uh, campaigns on social media i mean th these actors i mean the network i mentioned the efficiency of this network is because these people share the content uh, among each other now the content uh, will always be faster and and reaching more because lies Polarization, disinformation is always uh, going to to reach, uh, and algorithms, unfortunately, uh, will always support this. Uh, so on, the, on on our side, uh, it's 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 super difficult to to fight with the truth. Uh, we need to. Uh, it, it's not to say that we should uh, start uh, using the same tactics as these actors are using. I think we still should stick to our values, but. Uh, but we need to be much more creative. We need to uh, we need to have a better understanding that uh, uh, the only fact checking is not going to work uh, uh, in this in this battle. So we need to. That's why our campaign for mobilization. That's why reaching out to social media influencers. I mean, this is a. It would be for long uh, discussion, but uh, for me, it was very revealing. I mean, I I was reaching out personally. Uh, to these people, and it's a really special category of people. And uh, but if you want to reach young people on uh, on TikTok, on Instagram, uh, you know, Instagram was actually mostly used uh, in our case. Um, you need to you need to get out of the box, and you need to start using these new approaches uh, because otherwise it will not be. You will. I mean, we can all do this fantastic research and talk. Uh, you know, in our bubbles about uh, how we are happy with our research and all these things. But uh, if we want to uh, have some impact, uh, then I think we need to we need to be ready uh, to collaborate uh, and, and we need to network better among ourselves. And that's why uh, that's that is one of the main uh, lessons learned for me. Uh, and that's why Memo, for example, focuses only on, on, on elections. We We don't try to I mean, yes, we did some research in in other areas, but uh, but we take elections as our main specialty. Uh, so we really try to stay on that. But we we are happy to cooperate uh, with as many organizations as necessary. Under this big campaign, it was 133 organizations that participated, NGOs, uh, you know, 
academia, uh, business uh, people, uh, business uh, companies. So quite quite a huge effort, uh, which uh, then generated some some outcome. But of course, the actors on the other side are fully aware of this, and so they are now trying to do everything to prevent us from uh, keeping citizens active, because this, as I said, is the most important thing. Thank you very much. And also for a detailed presentation, it was very interesting. Thank you. Thank you, and I will share it obviously with Armen after we finish. Uh, thank you, and I see the link to the articles in the chat. Yeah. I'll get that as well. Mm -hmm. And so if we uh, have no more questions, actually, we are a bit already out of time. So just as a final remark, let me thank everybody for today's discussion. And, uh, we are very much looking forward to some cooperation in the future as well. Great. Well, I mean, from my side, very. I also am very grateful that you invited me to this event, and I really um, wanted to thank, uh, obviously, uh, also to Edgar and Victoria for interesting presentations, and uh, obviously, I'm sort of happy to uh, to, to to continue. Uh, and hopefully we can uh, do something meaningful together. Thank you. And uh, thank you very much. We, we finish this meeting. Uh, have a nice day. You too. All the best. Good luck. Bye bye. Bye bye.